Like a dog chained up Taking such a booze Welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is a special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live, download our free app, and stream all of our live local shows, including yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. We can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. My guest today is from the Be Yourself School. His mentors were originalists who sought to create on a sonic palette. My guest became deeply influenced by the tribal nature of the group, seeking authenticity in a material world. He is an independent filmmaker who understands what his strengths are, character development, keeping the thread of the character alive throughout the story, and knowing when too much of everything is just enough. He is an artistic director, responsible for setting a vibe that can intertwine with the tribal group that he looked up to. During the Fair the Well tour, my guests knew who to call for the intermission music. Neil Casal's Circle Around the Sun has now been taken from the hallways of cavernous football stadiums to the bandstand. My guest has circled around the sun many times. Dad's on tour again, hanging out with mom, needing to get closer to the tribe from the Be Yourself school. Eventually he did in high school, hitting the summer tours with a bulky VHS camera, shooting low quality videos of a band in transition. His father wanted him to keep busy and productive. At this time, my guest became fascinated with using film improvisation as colors turn to black and white and melt away into a run for the roses with David Morgan, Jerry Cortez, and Brent Midland, guys his father coveted for his own bands. Facial features only partially revealed, the melting of a snare drum while Brent sings about nobodies. Nobody from my guest's family lives in San Francisco anymore. His parents have moved to Hawaii while my guest has migrated south to Los Angeles, still maintaining independence and looking for a little green light on that speedway. Hey, hey, Justin Kreutzman, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Oh, Jake, that, that, that was awesome. Can you do my incoming voice messages? Just that exact <laughs> same thing would be perfect. Well, I mean, I don't know how thank many you, people... Thank you, thank you. I don't know how many people are going to be going to stay on to leave a message at that point, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great to... Dude, it's an honor to connect with you, man, and... Uh, Thank you for all your, your work on everything. So, um, you know, I wanted to ask you uh, about what you consider. I'm working on a film documentary with a, a guy, independent uh, doc maker in uh, Santa Monica on Stan Getz. And uh, I wanted you just to talk about the L.A. vibe and uh, what you feel about uh, non-dead related projects, what the scene is like for an independent film producer in Los Angeles. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, you, you don't even really need to say it. I mean, L.A. is the film capital of the world, and as much as I wanted it to, uh, the film business was just not going to move to Marin County. So uh, being down here, it's really about uh, proximity and availability. Uh, jobs have come up, and I've gotten to meet a whole ton of people. In fact, I'm working on an independent film right now with the surviving member of The Doors. Uh, I love The Doors, and so it's this cool, cool way to get into some, some music that's obviously not Grateful Dead, but, you know, not too far removed in terms of era and uh, historical impact. And uh, that, that happened because I lived down here, and they needed somebody, and they were like, oh, that's right, you live here. And uh, I got the job, and I know a lot of people working in independent film and, and also people working on network TV, that um, their whole careers are kind of based on just sort of being in the right place at the right time. That. I, I, you know, Densmore and I, uh, uh, we cooked uh, maybe three years ago when he was on his book tour, but you're talking about working with him and Krieger right now. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, John and I are editing a film right now together, and I got to tell you, it's the coolest thing. We're editing Writers on the Storm, and he's playing the beat next to me just so I can, you know, keep the rhythm while he's telling me stories about their original recording of it. And I'm just like, like, John, i got to stop you. This is just awesome. This is like a 3D post-production experience 
that like you know as a, you know as a fan I've read the books I've seen the documentaries but you know when you're sitting two feet from Densmore working with them talking about the groove and what the band was intending and what they're trying to say and what Jim you know how drunk was Jim that day or not drunk or what you know and all those kind of those little nuances that you get you can only get from you know talking to the the, the few people who are actually in the room who who uh, how how far in, are you going to go past uh, post mortem Morrison? Because I got to tell you, the I, do you know about the collaborate? If you don't, I can hip you to it. I'm sure John has the 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 albums they did, uh, him and Krieger did as the Doors. Uh, it was called the Butts Band. It was like mid. Yeah, yeah. I, we, we know about that, but this is actually based. We did um, in February. It was Ray Manzarek's birthday, and they did a tribute show down here at the Fonda Theater. And not unlike my Move Me Brightly Jerry birthday tribute, this is a Ray Manzarek birthday tribute, and I'm sort of sneaking a documentary in on him. I so love it. I, dude, I cannot the... believe that this is badass. I, I, Krieger, those guys were badasses. I mean, did you really uh, – I, I do find that some of their studio stuff is um, – it just doesn't stretch out like the dead, obviously. But they had their own mystique going on. I mean, you were hip to them uh, in, in this in the uh, when you were just a kid. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm a I'm a film guy, and so I really liked. I mean, I liked their music, but I liked the image. I liked that they were like UCLA film guys, and everything was very visual. And I mean, you've got Jim Morrison as your front man, who's you know, that's just such an iconic image just in himself. And I got into film because my dad was doing music for Apocalypse Now. And as we all remember, The Doors the End started that movie. So when I was seven, it was sort of my first impact making me want to become a filmmaker was associated with The Doors. I don't even know if I knew they were The Doors yet, but that music and that sound has been with me since then. Oh, that eerie, eerie wail. And uh, oh, that is classic stuff. Talking to Justin Kreutzman here on The Jake Feinberg Show. Um, I, this is a question for you because uh, you have two children, and so do I, and, and a lot of cats... Um, a lot of people, they tend to, when they have kids, they get more conservative in their lives. They hunker down and, uh, you know, maybe just become more conservative. And I just, from a from a artistic point of view, I know with my kids, it, it allowed me to dream again for a variety of reasons. Having children, seeing the beautiful, seeing how beautiful the creations that they are. And I'm just curious about if, if your kids have helped you dream at all or if they've changed or even expanded your consciousness as it relates to conceptions and ideas that you might have thought they weren't worthy before you had children oh de definitely definitely i mean uh, kids expand everything i mean kids expand uh what you want to show them of your life what you want to show them of the world kids make it so you may want to make sure that you're working enough that you can feed them so everything is just expansive and everything is just sort of on and it's it's it, you know it sounds so cliche but it's you get to see stuff through their eyes. I took my kids to um, one of the Fairly Well shows at, in Santa Clara and just kind of getting to see, you know, them play around deadheads and dance to Viola Lee Blues and just all that kind of, you know, sitting on the road cases that I probably sat on. Right, You know, all those kind of family moments, but in the Grateful Dead context. You know, it's, it's great. And also um, you lose a lot of the cynicism because, like, they just were – pure enjoyment of the music and the colors and the people and it was just you know just to I, I actually you know try to gleam as much as I can from them uh, and remembering what that innocence was like can you can you point to a specific thing because I mean you were one of the youngest kids to be around the Grateful Dead and I'm just curious about what you try to glean from them now and and also talk about the cynicism because I do see cats that are wrapped up now and uh and there's a bitterness, but for some reason, uh, I just, I, you know, before I just, you know, I guess there's just also a fearless quality uh, component to it as well. And I, just being an ind independent filmmaker, I just uh, am curious about, uh, you know, if you could point to a specific example of, of how they've sort of, you know, just made you be yourself more. Well, it's not even so much just being myself. It's just appreciating stuff. I mean, you know, I, 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 the Grateful Dead were going on when I threw, went through all my teenage years. And, you know, growing up, does anybody think what their dad is doing is that cool? I mean, you got, don't you kind of have to go through that rebellious, awkward? <laughs> I mean, it, se it seems like you must. It seems like it would be weird if you were just so into what your parents were doing and yeah. thought it was the coolest thing ever. So, you know, I had all those kind of trips where everybody in school was really into what my dad did. And it's just sort of like, you know, you know, isn't, you know their, their, their parents were like businessmen. 
<laughs> and so, like, you know, you get a certain amount of uh, cynicism, I guess, and, and hanging out with guys like the Grateful Dead, who are full of cynicism, it's, um, it's easy to sort of play into that. And when I watched my daughter dance to Grandpa, um, all that went away. And I just, she had no, like, she wasn't too cool to, you know, be seen dancing, and it was just music and enjoyment to her. And so that's, that just reminded me that um, that's what it's all about. And so, you know, but I've got, like, you know, 47 years of stuff to shed. She's only got, like, six years. So Right. I mean, but, there's a lot of shedding going on uh, everywhere in, in, in the world. I, I um, you know, I just kind of riffed at the beginning about your strengths as a producer. But, I mean, in general, uh, when you – do you like to delegate responsibility? Uh, what do you – and also, uh, what, like, even with the doors – uh, I mean, what are your what are your natural gifts as a film producer? Um, I'd like to think that I, I inherited some sense of rhythm that's helping me in my editing and my pacing, and just kind of feeling like when something should happen here or we should just hang a little longer here, and also the Grateful Dead thing of just not being repetitious. And I find a lot of a lot of stuff I see that I don't like is when somebody finds a rhythm or a style that they like, they do the entire piece that way, whether the music changes or ebbs and flows. And, you know, I, but I grew up editing Grateful Dead music, so it, I think that's kind of my natural thing is to let the music dictate where you're going. Um, the best, to me, the best work is when you don't notice it and you're paying attention to what you're supposed to be, which is either the music or the dialogue or something like that, and you don't notice a fancy camera move or, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't take you out of the moment. So what, and then... Like, but as far as uh, what did you learn uh, from them, from the dead, about um, not don't be repetitious? I mean, that, it's hard to do. I mean, can you give an example? Like, even in the I watched the Weird documentary, which was great, and uh, the other one. And uh, thank you. You know, and is there is there like is was the, can you point to a, a time in that film where you you where you said, let's stretch this out a little bit more, or let's, you know, is there a scene that you can point to in that? Because I just thought it, it, I thought it moved well. I thought it was crisp. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, you, you're, you have all that technology at your disposal now. So I just, I'm curious about uh, implementation in that sense. Well, the, in that, that film in particular, since we were trying to fit in his entire life story in like 90 minutes, obviously you weren't going to get complete musical performances and you're going to have to sort of pick your moment and that was really finding the balance of when you're just Bob's telling you a story and you just want to hang with that story. You don't need a lot of cutaways. You don't need music cues to keep sort of making it interesting. And then you find other moments where you're like, you let the music speak. And you're like, okay, you know what? You know, if this was straight TV world, they'd probably cut back because it's too much music or it's too much, you know, guys on stage that aren't very animated. But you know what? Let's, the music is really captivating here, so just stay with it. So it was just finding that balance. I'm, I, you know, I can't really give you a specific moment in the film. You just have to watch it and sort of see where we let Bob just sort of have a moment and then we sort of spice it up with some music and trying to find that balance. Talking to Justin Kreutzman here on the Jake Feinberg Show. I, I read somewhere about that you spent a summer in Pleasantville, Oregon, at Kesey's Farm. Uh, I did, I and, did. And, and you said it was an education, but I'd like you to go a step further and, and just talk, a, a, could you relay a specific story about, uh, I mean, I went to a Jewish summer camp in upstate New York, but and we had a ball, but it was primarily a sports camp. I just, could you talk about a seminal story from that summer experience at, at the Kesey Farm? Oh, there, there was a bunch of them. Well, first of all, when you go to spend the summer with Ken, you know, it's not a free ride. Like, the first thing you have to do is, is like, he wants you to go out in the field and water the cows. So what us kids would have to do is hide from Ken in the morning. Because otherwise you're out in, like, this field with these cows who basically want to just eat you or run you over. But I remember, that, I mean, one memory I really, because I was, boy, I was 12, 11 or 12. You know, I was, I was pretty young. And I remember... I found all, these, all this film out in his, his barn, and I was like, Ken, can we watch some of these movies? So he put up you know, the bed sheet and turned on the 16 millimeter, and it was all the acid test footage. And so I'm watching everybody take little sips out of, out of, out of this sort of cauldron. And of course, me being me, I'm like, what are you guys doing? And Ken, Ken's like, that's the LSD. And I just remember when Babs was there and Chuck Keezy, and it was like the whole you know, Mountain Girls, the whole prankster gang. And it was just one of those kind of like really innocent moments of like, Oh, yeah. Okay, I got it. But I just remember watching those guys watching themselves in their youth at acid tests 
on the wall at Ken's house and thinking, this is pretty cool. I mean, to me, it's it's a bit avant-garde. I mean, can you talk about uh, specifically your your folks? I mean, your dad wanted you to have exposure. He was Your dad was part of that whole experience. But, uh, you know, I don't know if my wife would be all right sending my kids off to, to that kind of experience. I mean, can you talk about how your parents – uh, didn't coddle you or if they did uh, because like you said I think you make a really good point and I never thought about it until you said it it you know I mean uh, most kids they they're not into what their parents are doing but your dad was a little bit different but did your parents just basically say Justin you know there, there's no reins on you just just go out and find yourself how, I mean how did that all work well you know and also, we, we, we all have to remember this was the 70s so I think things <laughs> I mean, I, I, I remember I grew up in a time where they opened the back door and you could walk down the street and when you're five or six and go to the play yard, and you weren't worried that somebody was going to abduct you. You weren't worried that somebody was going to shoot you. You know, was, and I grew up in Marin County. So Marin County in the 70s was a very um, open place, I guess would be the, the best way to do it. Mellow. And I think, I think my parents, um, they wanted me just to be happy. Uh, my, my, my parents wanted me to explore and... Uh, my dad and mom would 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 want to push me a little bit into you know trying stuff and and just I think they just wanted me to be well rounded and if uh, I meant hanging out with Ken Kesey one summer that was cool if it meant going to a private school that was cool you know it was all it was all it wasn't just those kind of weird psychedelic moments it was just whatever you know if I'd wanted to be a doctor they would have encouraged me to go to medical school you know all that kind of stuff it was just about being yourself very 60s and and you know finding out who you are and encouraging that. Um, tell me a little bit about, um, I mean, I've interviewed, uh, all the cats, uh, but this, this nobody's video is, is truly epic. And I believe that you, it was really a brainchild. Can you talk about the manifestation of nobody's the Brent Midland tune? And then ultimately, uh, just being able to, you know, there, there, there's interesting stuff there because it, you can, the faces are shrouded. You can barely see people. There's like some. I just would like you to take us through the whole conception. That was kind of one of your first projects, I think. Yeah, well, nobody's is actually very near and dear to my heart. I co-directed it with um, a fellow named Gio Coppola, and um, I met him because his dad is Francis Coppola, and I met him when we were doing Apocalypse. He was older than me, but he always encouraged me and sort of let me tag along with him on film sets and you know different stuff that he was doing. And he wanted to get into the music video world. And so I was like, you know, why don't we do a music video? And he's like, oh, cool, cool. And we had this whole thing set up with a different guy. And at the last minute, the guy canceled. I was like, oh, my God, this is, this is horrible. So I called my dad. I'm like, hey, Dad, can you put a band together so we could do this video? So Dad calls Brent. Brent's like, yeah, well, we could use one of my songs. And they called David Morgan and Jerry Cortez. And they formed the band just for this video. And we used a lot of the old Coppola equipment. And... Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's really special to me because Geo died actually three months after we did it. So it's, it's kind of my first video and it's uh, the only thing we really got to do together. Is that, was that the genesis of the go-ahead band, though? I mean, they that's, had never... That's, that's, that's exactly it. Um... And they're like, hey, this is, this is kind of cool. Maybe we should do some of this. I mean, did you... Okay, I, and I really need to get this on the record because it's, it's important for, for me specifically. I never saw the dead... Uh, uh, you know, I was born in 78. Um, but, uh, you know, when I was at these flea markets in New York City, you know, wandering around, uh, you know, I found this uh, this pretty um, interesting VHS uh, copy of a, of a show from uh, Indianapolis, Small Tennis Court, 1984 Summer Tour. And in the adjustment on the on the on the video at the bottom, it says uh, Justin K. And yeah. I, and I'm like, dude, this dude. I I said, okay, so you you're in high school, your dad's like, come on the road with the band, uh, and I'm telling you, it was Justin K. And I'm like, I I believe that might have, and I still I'm gonna send you the VHS so you can look at it. But it's like, this this was surreal. The bus was parked in the back of the court, and I just want to know if that's if the, if yeah. you were, if you were on tour and you did that stuff because uh, this and this is eighty four you're talking about is June it, it, June tour yeah June eighty four and and there's a because we, we didn't we didn't get we didn't get our first video camera until the summer of eighty five and that's where you see a lot of the stuff that got stolen and is on YouTube that's all from the summer of eighty five on uh, eighty 
before I was going to school in Southern California, so well, just send it to me. Maybe the dates are wrong. I mean, obviously I'm Justin K, but not that there's not another one. But that's not I, honestly that the date that the date couldn't be right. Right. But then again, I would have been 14, so I can't say I remember exactly everything I've done in my life. So you never know. Did you do you did you go to Radio City Music Hall? I did. I did. What was that? Uh, experience because I think I think your mom wound up in the in the in the video as well. That, that's actually my stepmom, Shelly. Ste- stepmom Shelly. So who is your? Where is your original mom? Well, my original mom is still alive and well. She lives in Texas, uh, but her, her and my dad divorced in. Let's see what album was that? I think she was there till Terrapin, and then Shelly came. This is how I mark my life. <laughs> and my stepmom came on Shakedown Street. Wow. Okay. So that was that was Shelly, and then uh, I just wonder. I mean. That what was that experience like? That was Radio City was a big deal in 1980. Well, it was great because I got to get out of school. Um, we get a call late night saying Dad's lonely. Forget school, fly out and and spend two weeks in New York. And it was just crazy. I mean, it was this is the only time I'd really experienced. I remember this really well. Going from the Navarro Hotel to Radio City it was weird. My dad and Shelley. And pulling up to the back, um, Deadheads jumped on the car. It's like you see in those Beatles movies. <laughs> yeah. wasn't wasn't quite. I mean, it was probably like three guys. But you know, when you're a kid, you're like, oh my god, this is like the most exciting thing ever. And security's making you rush in. And then we get inside, and then Carrie Fisher came to one of the shows. Wow. And Empire Strikes Back had come out, and I was like ten. So like, forget about it. <laughs> yeah, right. I, you know, right. you know, game over. Like you know, Princess Leia's in the house. I was like, this is cool. <laughs> so I mean, that those are my memories of Radio City. Casal, he basically said that you uh, called him a few weeks out and said, we need this much music for this, uh, for this show. And you, and, you know, I mean, he was just sort of tongue in cheek about it because I know you guys are good buddies, but it's like he, he was, he had never done anything like that before. Uh, Can you talk about your mindset? I mean, was it the idea that you you thought that he was most capable of of being able to go in and produce five hours of pretty entertaining, <laughs> uh, slightly different type of uh, music than the Dead. Uh, I can't. I just would love you to talk about uh, you know the when you were given that responsibility and then ultimately uh, how you decided to to tap into Casal. Well, well, here's the thing. Neil made the fatal 
fatal mistake. Uh, when we were doing uh, the other one, the Bob Weir movie, I, I did the exact same thing. I called him, said, hey, Neil, do you think you can in a couple of days throw together a little music we can use that sort of sounds like Grateful Dead but, you know, isn't really Grateful Dead? And um, I don't know if you know this, but he's the musical director on the other one film. And he did a great job. I, I didn't never know that. I did not know that. Yeah, that, so, that, so he did such a great job on that. When Fair Thee Well was happening, I, I said, hmm, let's see, where's Neil's number? And, of course, he was like, I, I could do that. That sounds like fun. You know, I mean, Neil's game for anything. Um, ha- that it took off in such an exciting way is literally my proudest moment in all of the Fair Thee Wellness. Is just, um, I was just so happy. Um, that, you know, one, it, just, it took on a life of its own. People responded to it. And, you know, like I said, he did it in like two days. It was just, an, it was just one of those kind of, there was a million ways this could have gone terribly, terribly wrong. And it all went terribly, terribly right beyond our wildest expectations. So, again, Neil, Neil gamely said yes. So um, I, I'm waiting for the next one when I call him up. I mean, is it, I think I saw something where they're actually going to be touring with that music. Is that right? I believe so. I think, didn't they just play... Um, Lockin or one of those? Po- yeah, I just saw this thing where it was like, wow, Circles Around the Sun has now been taken out of the sound systems and onto the bandstand. I just was like, that's that's a pretty impressive thing. Uh, it's a real thing. It's, 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 it's come alive. It's its own, its own thing now. How, how, how much of it, though, do you feel that burn, like the creative burn when, it's, when you're up against it? I mean, are you somebody who's, uh, I don't know how to say this. I mean, you know, when I listen to your dad, play drums you know i never saw the band live but there are so many times where he'll just start a beat and they'll go into you know brown eyed woman or they'll go into some tune and uh, sometimes you just pick up the sticks and say let's hit it um and there's not a lot of pre-prep and planning but yet you you know that on the other side you said it could have been a it could have been a disaster uh i'm just curious about your mentality about when you work best i mean could you give an example of uh, whether you're plotting and you're meticulous or whether you go into stuff and you kind of just, you know, you, you burn when, when, when you're up against it. It's all about a deadline. It's all about <laughs> the deadline. It's all about you have 48 hours before you have to be showing this in front of a stadium full of people. That, 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 you know, I guess if, you, if you've got three months, you know, you, you know, you do a little work, you go to lunch, you think about it, you know, you, you, you know, you know, you know what I mean? But like when you, when you just have to do it, you just have to go with like just blind faith and just hope that all your instincts are correct and that somebody agrees with your choices. So that, you know, that I think, I think, I think that's not unsimilar to a lot of people we know. Right. I'm just like, how important is it for you? Like, just take the Morrison film uh, to uh, create new history. I mean, most of the time, if I'm trying to transcribe stories about cats or about musical experiences or about philosophy, I'm just trying to do stuff that is not already out there and been regurgitated. Uh, And I'm just curious, like with with the with the Doors documentary, for instance, I mean, are you are you trying to search for those nuggets that have not been explored, things that, you know, stones that have not been overturned yet? Honestly, not really. I mean, their career w- w- was relatively short in the grand scheme of things. And, you know, there's been a lot of books about them. There's been a lot of documentaries about them. And there's been a lot of really, really good ones. And this is one that's more, the angle is it's a tribute to Ray. It's also the first time that John and Robbie had played together, really, I think in like 15 years, and there had been lawsuits and all this thing, and they were the, like the friends that went to high school. So it's about friendship. So I tried to, you know, you, you get the stories, but, but you know, there's there stories you can get in another book. I mean, there's, not, you know, there's only so many songs and so many stories about how Light My Fire was written and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you, I, I tried to just approach it like two friends rekindling their, their friendship in tribute to two members of the band who are no longer with us and kind of approaching it with the, the, the personal angle. And also I tried to put some humor into it. Like John had a great quote. He's like, we used to be kind of funny. Nobody ever portrays us as having a sense of humor. And so I tried to put in like them making fun of themselves and some of the lighter moments and just try to, you know, I, I didn't, you know, they've already done the definitive doors documentary. So I wasn't trying to, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm just trying to, have a, a real personal approach. It's I'm curious though because when I caught up with uh, with John, uh, he was like, uh, I mean, that was 
do you, is there some sort of, um, you're right, the definitive documentary has already been done, but it was like, uh, is this sort of like, a, it's really more about the human connection because there was so much bad blood about, well, you know, we're going to go out on tour as the Doors, Ray and Robbie were, and then John was like, no, that's not what Jim wanted, and you can go out as the new Doors or the Doors of the 21st century, but uh, you're not going out as the Doors, and then there was this huge lawsuit do you guys are you able to we 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 address that we address, it's not it, it's not the point of the film but i i feel it would have been really i feel as a, as a fan other fans who had been watching it and if it didn't come up or was addressed people would be like oh they're just glossing over it now oh now they're all friends again but no it's talked about and it's talked about very emotionally from both sides and honestly i i feel but it's not it's not the we're not trying to rehash the all i mean all this is such a you know, it was a sort of no, absolutely, and it's a tribute to Ray. I mean, I, I think that that's probably the other thing is that he passed away, and they probably didn't have the opportunity to, to give their their goodbyes, really. And uh, well, you'll have to watch the film. You never know. Well, you'll have I to mean, watch when the film. is it? Let's let's. Is it how how close is it? when is it coming out? Uh, well, well, it's going to be part of their next year celebrations. Next year being the 50th anniversary of when their first album came out. Um, so this project, I'm not sure what form, but this will be one of the new things coming out in that 50th celebration. So sometime next year is about the closest I can come. We're just, we're just now getting the final approvals from Robbie and John, and we're, we're just in that home stretch kind of, kind of phase. Well, I, dude, I mean, uh, God, that Densmore's class. I still haven't gotten to Krieger yet, man. He's, he's a hard cat to, to track down. But I wanted to – a um, couple of questions before I let you go um, – can you talk about a time in your life when you faced adversity, uh, how you overcame it, and how it made you stronger? Well, I mean, everybody faces adversity on many, many different levels. Um, a lot of the adversity I, I felt like I faced in my life has been self-inflicted through bad choices uh, I've made at various points. And can, you give an really can you give an example? Well, we don't need to get too specific, but uh, at certain points in my life, I was, let's say, less than sober. So um, I let things and substances take control of my life more than just having a good time. Right. And it was about deciding what you want in life and what's really important. And funny enough, people like Garcia would have sort of the most sobering advice because he wouldn't bullshit you. Like most people have this kind of like, we need to say this, and this is the politically correct thing to say. And he would just kind of lay it out like you can be this kind of guy or you can wind up and be this kind of guy. Like, do you want to be that guy? I don't know. It's up to you. You know, it wasn't like he was telling you, like, you should do That's the thing about him. He wasn't a you should be doing this. He's like, this is how I see it. You can be this or you can be that. It's up to you. It's your life. You make your own decision. And just, you know, when somebody sort of puts that in your court and lets you, you know, control your own destiny, I definitely, it was very sobering. You know, coming from from him, and just just he had a he carried a great presence with him, and so you 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 know when when he said stuff, you listened. Sure, I mean, when did he start? When did you guys first start to really, outside of him being like, oh, there's Justin? Uh, when, when did you guys? When did he start dropping knowledge and also just giving you that, like you said, that presence? When did you when did you really start feeling that? Well, when he came out of his coma and. You know, I had known him, obviously, the 16 years of my life before that, but, you know, I was becoming a man and, uh, you know, and actually, you know, could hold a conversation and had my own <laughs> thoughts, and I wasn't just the, the little kid in the corner sort of frightened of all the, the big, noisy, crazy people around. <laughs> and he came out of his coma, and he was like a new guy. I mean, he was the same guy, but, like, all of a sudden he was really open, and he wanted to hang out. He just wanted to hang out. We used to go to movies together. We used to watch TV together. You know what I mean? Just stuff that you'd, you know, Jerry, Jerry's house used to be kind of frightening. He didn't really want to, like, know what was going on in there. And then suddenly he was like this open book and just, you know, and he was a great talker. He loved to just tell you stories and, you know, this and that. And he was a great reader. So he, you know, and he could read more books in one plane ride than I probably read my whole life. So um, it was probably, you know, late 80s. Right. Right. And to see him come out of that was was inspiring. I, I have to say it for me. Um, I uh, my wife, uh, Yaru, has uh, come in as I consider it almost an angelic thing that uh, I was kind of a nomadic person before I met her. And, uh, you know, marriages work, but uh, it is uh, bared a lot of beautiful fruit for us. And 
I did want you know your Stephanie's birthday was was yesterday. I just wanted you to talk about how you met her and, and ultimately how she's changed you as a human being. Oh well, I mean it, it's uh, it, it's night and day. I, I, I am such a better person for for having known my lovely wife. In fact, we had a great night last night. We went to see Bob, who, of course, it's perfect, grateful that timing that he's playing L.A. on her birthday. And yeah. John came and played, and they had this great, you know, Grateful Dead kind of show. And, you know, it just, you know, I, me being me, I, I, you know, you always want to kind of impress. So, like, during the set break when, when Bob was just doing his thing, I snuck her in the backstage, and we went up, and Bob gave her a birthday hug. And then John Mayer came in and gave her a birthday hug. So it was, you know, it was one of those kind of, like, you know, special Grateful Dead little things. And um, we, we, we met very randomly in an airport. <laughs> you, met, you met in an airport? This is the real story. This is the real story. We, we met in the, the Philadelphia airport because I was coming back. The Dead had just played with the Almond Brothers for an Obama thing at Penn State. You're going to have to check me on the dates, but I know it was 2008. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I was flying back to San Francisco. She was flying back to San Francisco. Uh, it turns out we had a mutual friend that I was traveling with, and it turns out we lived in the same town. So, you know, go figure. Wow. And then now, today, do you, how, how lucky do you, I mean, how lucky do you feel? Um, uh, luck is too small a word for how I feel. It's, uh, it's, 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 like, it's like when my dad describes meeting Jerry. It's one of those things that it's such a life changer that now you can't even imagine had that not happened because you don't want to. So it just um, well, I mean, I just you know, just to be fair, anything, I mean, what, yeah. whatever you want to call it, it, it's too small a word. Absolutely, I just you know, I do want to say, I mean, I've devote, I've become somewhat, uh, uh, I've been on a pilgrimage for quite some time, uh, and I, I, I love truly your dad's drumming has has seen me through a lot of adversity over the last few years. I've interviewed five hundred cats, and uh, and so to get to the Kreutzmann family was only through. Stephanie Kreutzmann and uh, and I just wanted to give her a big thank you on the world this worldwide broadcast with Justin Kreutzmann. Uh, final thought for you, my friend, um, uh, is tell me the best way to get a hold of your father. <laughs> Let me give you his number. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you want to interview him? What do you? I just, I just, you want to go, just, I, you want to go, go fishing? I want to, I, I, I want to. I want. I, I just want to catch a, a thirty-minute hang with him, man. I really do. Uh, the best thing, write, write me a letter, send it to Stephanie, and I will uh, honestly pass it on to him and uh, let him and you take it from there. Hey, my man. Much love to you, and uh, let's. Uh, Let's reconvene down the road once that uh, the, the doors hits the hit this hits the screen. That's a that's a phenomenal uh, thing. I can't wait for it. Well, thank you, man. It's been great talking to you. All right, man. Talk to you soon. Okay. Peace. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, uh, dream deferred no longer. Justin Kreutzman, uh, legendary uh, character and the son of uh, Billy Kreutzman, the drummer. Now he's a, a prolific filmmaker in his own right, and uh, we just wax there for about thirty-five minutes here on Power Talk. Um, we are going to uh, re rejoin the Jim Parisi show and come back with Matt Chamberlain.